Hey, here we are again real quick. I have uh, some production artwork, and all these are up for sale on eBay. You can look up my by title. Uh, these are large acetates. They were uh, part of uh, uh, some that I bought from Brazil that would publish DC and Marvel. And, of course, they would have to send them uh, the artwork, and they would put them on uh, large you know, this is part of the printing process, and you can see on the side here, I've just put these in a large canvas because they are to, to back them so that you can see them better. This is for Weird War, weird Worlds uh, that had Tarzan, Edgar Rice Burroughs Tarzan featured in there also. Of course, this round circle here would be the DC Bullet. You know, it would say DC or DC for DC Comics in there and then of course you'd have the price over here and that but it obviously this was done because this is the black line artwork that was kind of photo you know processed on this plastic and plastic was first developed in the 1940s uh or late 1930s for for windshields uh for the military for their for their planes so plastic's been around a long time I know a lot of people would like to do away with it. And of course you should recycle plastic. So it doesn't wind up in the dumped in the oceans or the dump or anything. Cause it does have a long degradable life, but uh, unless, you know, it's in the sun and then it becomes brittle, but even then a very long life. But anyway, that's not what this stream about. It's about uh, some of these plastic acetates that, that look uh, good. They haven't yellowed They're, They are old. I mean, this was done at the time of production. You can see down here where my finger, where I'm tapping my finger, that is, I can generally, by the face, I can tell who did the artwork. That is Murphy Anderson. And it says, plus, his choice is slavery or death. His name is, and then we don't get to know his name. Why? It would have been printed here in this blank spot in a different color, sometimes in magenta or others that would not show up on this part of the process. So you only have part of the cover here, but the majority of it, I always thought this one here, I looked it up. I can't remember exactly who did it. I think Murphy Anderson might've had some part in it, but I always thought that this figure looked like a lot like uh, what um, uh, Jim Aparo, the great uh, uh batman artist and of course he did other things too but you can see up here up to the top it says sparta that's who did their publishing and it has like cover title line and the month and everything there but also around here you have notations blue ts you have black ts you have red ts you have yellow ts and this would have been the different colors of course they, in printing they say sienna for red they say magenta but um yeah, just look at the detail on that. Uh, if you can see it on that dragon he's trying to kill. This was a short-lived uh, little title. Of course, they brought it back in recent years. Uh, but yeah, just the omission of different things. And some of them do omit. Uh, see, if I held it up like this, you wouldn't get a very good look. So I'm, I'm putting, and these are fairly large. Uh and there are smaller acetates that they made, but these are some large ones. Uh, this is another uh, fairly short-lived. This is number nine, though, Claw the Unconqueror. And they have brought, uh, in recent years, uh, Andy Smith worked on Claw the Unconquered. Uh, and it says Claw up there, cover title Claw, and even says September 1976. And you know it's 76 because it has... In this instance, it was published in black, probably, or something that would register. So they had the DC right in the middle. If you see that, it's probably a bicentennial year, a 1976 cover. And of course, the barcode, which would have been on the stands. And uh, you only get partially part of the wording because it would have been done in a different color. Uh, so there are some blank spots on these, but this is production artwork. And without this being done, this phase of the production, you wouldn't have had the comic book. So this is production art, and this stuff was scrapped, destroyed. That's what makes it so rare. Um, sometimes you'll get notation uh, notations on the borders of these things. Uh, a great rock monster there. 
Uh, I believe this might be an Ernie Chan cover. Uh, uh, cover. Uh, the glare's not too bad on that. The canvas seems to, you know, block a lot of that out, but he's fighting this giant, what appears to be rock monster, great detail in the city back there. Do you have any claw, the unconquered? Most people don't. He was kind of like a Conan character, but it, on one hand, he had a claw. And then they kind of made that claw monstrous. Even in the, even up here, uh, they have a little claw at the end of the, uh, at the end of the uh, title there. In the border. A lot of these are going to be DC on these large ones. I have mostly DC stuff. Uh, I've need to find some of the Fantastic Four covers from the 60s that I have like this and I'll show them in the future. This is World's Finest 233. I've got another thing on nothing but World's Finest up on my channel so if you want to see till the last issue of World's Finest and some very old uh, World's Finest all the way up to the last issue. It's not every issue of course. It was a very long run but they, they ended that and of course that starred superman and batman uh again this is probably from 76 although it probably says up here it is an october issue and gives you the issue number and the title up there in the margin of course this would have been cut out and not put on there because it it would have it already right here and then you have your authority code there that's usually on there but uh, another one-eyed monster and you don't get all the dialogue or i command my females Okay, well, we should always command females, right? <laughs> anyway, uh, there's Superman and Batman, and they're having to deal with one bug-eyed monster. One beam, as they call it. Bug-eyed monster. But the placement here tells me it's 1976 because it's in the middle of the issue, and that's what DC did Uh during the bicentennial year, 200 years of uh, America being a nation, started in 1776. 1776, we think, was a long time ago, but it's really not. If you think about it, uh, if you took the normal lifespan of a person of 80 years and you had 80, 80, 80, you'd be back to 1776 as time goes on. Of course, that'll change, but only three generations away. So 1976 is not uh that far away as we might think in our mind again world's finest up here as the issue this was one of the dollar gi uh, giants that went for a dollar in the early 80s and um this is a jim aparo cover we um we mentioned him this does have some uh production uh boxes here on the side and they have like uh covers for february uh here noted on the side you can see that a little bit there i'm sorry these things are so it's hard to get it really close but this is a vampire cover and it has the phantom stranger and you can see even in his title here phantom was really uh delineated there but it you know just has the outline of stranger there and then it had some wording right above it and not all the dialogue is in these things but this uh, Superman's been turned into a vampire and the Phantom Stranger is confronting him um, on this cover. You may have this issue, you know, or, uh, one of those early 80s uh, giants. You, right there, the word new is, is kind of different. So it's probably in another color, probably red or something, just as the outline of it. But this also had stories in it of um black canary and wonder woman and you know that because you see their heads there of course and then it also had a creeper story and a a green arrow story in it so these dollar ones i bought a few when they came out not every issue didn't sadly didn't see this issue uh this is pretty nice jim aparo cover uh, of course a long time batman but he also drew specter and adventure comics and other great things but um this man's been attacked by as Captain Obvious there, but we don't see all his dialogue. And he says, Phantom Stranger says, yes, my friend, turn and face thee. And we don't know what to face. What the Superman uh, clawed 
he has claws and fangs a uh, vampire there so another nice world's finest cover and again the, the circles which would have been the dc big bullet that they have for a while and you see the outline of the dc uh i think it said dollar comics there and then you'd have the price and some of the other pertinent information in this other circle here and sadly it's left out because it wasn't part of this this you know pro uh, printing process it's part of a process a five-stage process back then to uh bring your comics to you every month here is a wonderful Mike Grell cover, Batman cover. Uh, not really gray tone, but, you know, it'll speak for itself. And I had a graded 8.5, that CGC graded book of that, uh, I believe. Usually I tried to get the books that I have production artwork, but that's Mike Grell with Rochelle Ghoul. And Batman's in his hand, just an iconic cover from the Bronze Age. And by Bronze Age, I mean the 70s. Yeah, the Golden Age from, uh, you know, to the Age. And then you had Bronze Age. And you had Copper Age, as we call it, or some call it Modern Age. Here's a page, not a cover. And this being from Brazil, it has Portuguese, as, but it has uh, The Phantom, which is a long-time running title, over 1,400 issues down Australia. The Phantom, Pete, uh, the famous pulp hero with the shadow, and Doc Savage, the man of bronze, and they actually called Doc Savage Superman before Superman was called Superman. Uh, check in on that. There are some things on YouTube that talk about the history of pulps. And um, he's being chased by a herd of elephants in this one up a tree. And then there's a great snake indicated here in the last panel. As the and and it is raining. You see rain, and but you see the in shadow there, sort of noir type. You see a snake. I don't know if you can see that or not in the last panel, right? is indicated in the trees to add a little bit, but you see the streaks of rain. Just one, I don't know who this artist is that did this. If you do know, give me a shout out. I will be showing some more pages here just shortly. But uh, the Phantom, great laid out page. I don't have, these are up for sale, so I don't have them matted in frame, but you can imagine how these would look matted in frame for any, any person that really wants to show off some of this great one-of-a-kind production art. These are generally one-of-a-kind items that were made for the in the printing process, and and these were probably kept on file and not destroyed. But a lot of the stuff was destroyed. Most of the stuff was destroyed. Cover artwork, um, pages, just anything you know. Where it was published. This is another great. Um, page probably by the same artist all these phantom pages i got at the same time and they look like they're done by the same artist uh, of course phantom it shows his ring there on his finger uh it, you know if you know to look for it of course he would hit people and leave a skull mark on his victims the bad guy's face mostly but he's attacked by this tiger he's uh jumping on the tiger in the first uh um panel and so it's got the best of him rolling over and has his jungle knife of course he had a a pistol as well uh and kills the tiger i think he in this story he's looking these pages are probably from the all the same story he's looking for his white horse that he rode but just a wonderful action tradition action page in the tradition of tarzan sort of jungle type characters of course, Tarzan came out first in the movies in 1911, and the actor's name was Elmo. I can't tell you his full name. I can't remember it right now, but uh, uh, can you imagine Elmo? I'm mean, Tarzan, you know, but wonderful, wonderful phantom cover. I'm going to speed up on these things. There's not a huge amount in this stack, but I don't want this to go too long. 
And I need to check in with the chat and just see if anyone's dropped in. We had uh, Felix uh, Haas and and uh, another gentleman come in, uh, Greg, I believe, uh, last time. Not seeing anybody drop in the chat right now. Kind of doing these uh, streams at random at different times, and that kind of hurts people coming in, uh, not being on a regular basis streaming. But I am streaming, trying to get two videos out each day. Uh, so grow my channel, grow the content, give you good value, uh, at different lengths. If they go too long, you know, I'll cut them and make them into two or three videos. I haven't done a three one yet, but again, a tiger here, I believe this is, uh, the page before that he's firing at the tiger, uh, actually two tigers. He kills one and the other one. And this is when he's jumping. This is the prior page where he's jumping on his back. And then we saw eventually that he rolled him over and killed him with his life. Right. Uh, but this is the prior page to that. Just wonderful. I don't, I, I think these phantoms I've had them up for a while and, uh, I took them off for sale. I'm, I, I really didn't want to sell any of them. I did get an offer on some, some inquisition about them. Inquisition. Is that right? Um, but I think I want to really keep these. These are so nicely, you know, action-packed issues, atmospheric. I think this page here is more atmospheric here. Of course, you can flop them around back, you know, and the action go the other way uh, if you're not careful. But here he's looking and yelling for his horse. And uh, you just see the atmosphere there, the mist, the rocks, the the gnarled trees, and just the the different, whoever this artist was, you see, uh, you know, a long shot here, sort of medium shot there, close up of him yelling and kind of a, a medium shot there of the, of the hero. But you just see, if I can get close enough, just the atmosphere, the lines and, and what would this look like color? Would it have killed it or would it enhanced it and made it better? I think in some instances, but look at that, even at a distance, just the way it's laid out. Multi panel, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven panels, large one up here. You know, just a great, great layout. Tells you the story in one page. He's looking, he's hearing things, and you have the, the sound effects here. Hero in Portugal, again, they in Portuguese for the dialogue. Here we're going back to DC. I do have some, like those, some non-DC and Marvel in there. So this is Karate. This is 35 Center, the Bronze Age in the mid-70s. And this is Rich Buckler and Bob McLeod. I have trouble saying his name. Bob McLeod, I'll just say Bob McLeod. Uh, I met him. I met Rich Buckler as well in 1983. That was the year that I bought, met Bob as well. And Andy Smith has on a, an interview with him. So check out that if you want to know more about Bob. He was the creator of New Mutants graphic novel, which spun off, of course, into the comic. Uh, wonderful Legion of Superhero and Superboy. And I do believe this is the first appearance of this villain called Major Disaster. And I know back in the 70s, they actually did a, a uh, promo book with uh, this villain. Of course, a classic cover you may have in your collection, the Legionnaires going everywhere. And Major Disaster there with his whipping up the air into, uh, I guess, a tornado to uh, take the Legion and Superboy out. Well, something tells me it's going to take a little bit more than that. And also, if you look down here, it looks like it has uh, Shazam or uh, not just the Legionnaires, but, you know, has a Shazam in there as well. Captain Marvel, the original Captain Marvel for a moment, the hold of the name. Most of these are going to be covers. I do have some inside pages as well, but here's a great early Mike Kaluta cover. Uh, 
sort of not more adventure uh, oriented. Looks like the stallion that uh, the knight, the shining knight rode, giant Pegasus. But uh, this is supposed to be adventure comics. It was an anthology. This is 425 in the early 70s. The round bullets there again, blank. But there's Mike Kaluta cover early in his career for adventure comics. Nice Pegasus. I think Jack Adler, he was one of the ones that from DC, uh, the colorist and archivist and photographer and painter and just all around talented person. Hired Mike Kaluta, Neil Adams, uh, Bernie Wrightson. Hired a bunch of those guys and got them into comics. And maybe um, Starlin as well. He came out of, I've just got a uh, one of his early, uh, and I'll show it once I get it in the mail. Uh, Jim Starlin, um, he did, I've got it covered up there. Uh, I've shown it. Uh he did a, a mystical type character and like a destroyer type character and of course created so many uh, characters like Thanos uh, for Marvel. Uh, he, but interesting enough on sort of this fan fanzine or this fan comic from Texas Trio, he just on the cover uh, wrote Star instead of Starlin. So very early in his career. Now this one here is Al Milgram. He's a penciler and inked a lot of things, and especially for Marvel. And um, uh, this is the first appearance of going up against Firestorm, another 35-cent Bronze Age cut. As DC incorporated up here, Sparta, where they got their stuff published. And you see, this is Firestorm, I believe, number four. He had a short run. Firestorm had a short initial run. Yeah, it says number four there. Firestorm, the nuclear man. And there towards the end, after Firestorm came out, he actually made an appearance. He made some appearances in the latter years of uh, the Super Friends in the 80s. So he's been animated as well. I think I have one animated piece from that. This is uh, Dick Garagiano. Uh, cover, and this is one of those uh, dollar comics, and dollar comics must have been on this issue, which is number 486 of Detective Comics. Detective Comics as well had the dollar comics during the early 80s, around 83 or so, 82, 83, and it would have said dollar comics here, would have had the DC bullet here, and would have had the price and the and uh, what I liked about it, the uh, month and the year, I believe, in there. I like to have those things on the cover. Of course, you have the authority code. It's usually in black and white, so it usually is on here. But this is a great uh, Dick Garagiano cover. And then on the side here, it would tell you the different features in here. All bonus stories featuring the Human Target and Alfred. Human Target made his first appearance in Action Comics. And of course, he had a short-lived a TV series, and Batgirl in action. We don't know. What, five all-new thrillers. Usually had about five uh, on these dollar comics. They usually had about five stories. But you see some someone's uh, met a horrible death there. The smoking, skull. Batman's keeping the crowd back. Got his arms out. And there's a DG, a little DG down there, uh, telling you it was done by Dick Garagiano. He signed his stuff kind of like that. Not always. Usually he would sign his stuff, Dick Garagiano, you know, and it would be there by the, here by the barcode, you know, up and down, kind of like Marvel did it. But different placement of the names sometimes on the artwork, with different artists. Now, this is, uh, a treat. This is uh, Walt Simonson, early Walt Simonson and Dick Garagiano Batman cover. Of course, this was done for e and Ebal was down and, it, and the wording is in Portuguese except for their names signed here, Simonson and Garagiano. 
And uh, but this is early Walt Simonson for DC Comics, and he bought reprinted a lot of these classic covers. Trying to get it where you can see, you see the train tracks there, and just the, but you see their signatures right there. See it on the side of the tracks, and you got the train barreling down. They're fighting on the. Of course, Batman couldn't survive the train. If it was Superman, no big thing. This guy, this Minotaur-looking guy, looks like who's oversized. Look at the size of his fist compared to Batman's, and almost as big as his face. So he's got to really fight fight on his hand. But looks like he's going to get Batman. Looks like he's going to give him a a karate chop. And if you like black and white artwork. You know, of course, all this would have been colorized. We know his boots would have been blue and his and his hands there would have been blue. We know how Batman's colored. Uh, but uh, if you like black and white work and then and then, of course, just the background that sets across this and the, the darker elements of Batman is kind of gray toned in these things. Not an actual gray tone color, but that's the way it cover color. But that's the way they come out on these things. Different tones, different shades and tints. Grabbing another one here. This is a page. And this is special because this was an unpublished uh, cover done by John Basima and Bill Black. And this is, but they later, in issue for, I believe for issue eight, that it was made for issue eight, but they didn't go with this cover. But they did later in, I think, issue 14 of Tarzan from DC Comics run, collector's pinup page. And uh, I'll show it to you real quick. There's gorillas being gunned down, and, of course, they're shooting at Tarzan as well. Great John Basima artwork. Would have done the, the close-up of Tarzan there in the insert. But uh, that's John Basima with the great Bill Black from AC and Paragon. And I've shown some stuff of that in an earlier of some of Bill Black stuff. I've still got a lot more Bill Black and Bill Black stuff signed and stuff. But it says here on the Tarzan pinup page, which would have been, I think, an issue 14. If I'm wrong about that, it's been a while. So, But, yeah, it's neat that they've got Basima slash Black down here. Black uh, Bill Black uh, did some stuff for Marvel and did some stuff for DC. But he's uh, really an early independent publisher, starting with Paragon in the early 70s and running up and then becoming AC Comics. You might get Film Force, his all-female uh, super team. Uh, of course, he had uh, Sentinels of Liberty, which before uh, really DC got the rights to do like uh, the impact line uh, with uh, The Question and uh blue beetle and other night veil and other characters like that uh they were featured in uh, some of those early 80s um uh comics as a super team but it says ever wonder how the same super talented artist might draw the same page on two different days well we did and we got a chance to learn the answer when for reasons too complicated to go into big john basima two versions of the very same scene used as the cover of issue number eight pretty quick pretty quick and they picked the one they liked best but they didn't want it to go to waste and that was good because we get to see this wonderful thing uh the uh cover was i can't remember who inked uh, that particular issue that was published and this is roy thomas talking because at the end he says roy signs it roy uh and he would have been an editor over there. Um, worked for Marvel as well. But, okay, I'm sorry, I told you wrong. This is M Marvel's run on DC. You know, John Basimo did work mostly for Marvel. He did do a few select things. He also worked for Dale in his early career. Um, so, to pay the bills with. Uh, but, um it's the same scene done a little bit differently for issue eight. You've already seen the first version inked by Alfredo Alicia. Okay, so it tells us the inker. Now for your enlightenment and edification, here's the second as inked by Marvel newcomer, newcomer at that time, Bill Black. Enjoy, uh, Tarzan Ophite. 
and uh, just a wonderful pinup that they stuck, I believe, in issue 14. And I just love that Ink Black, uh, that um, Bill Black got to, uh, you know, ink John Basima. I'm, I'm sure he was glad of that too as a newcomer. Wouldn't you like to do ink anything done by John Basima that wrote, that uh, illustrated how to draw the Marvel away with uh, Jack Kirby? Here we have a daily page really put in, and it's dated uh, Sunday, June 7th, 1942. This was probably a reprint. Uh, but this is Print Valiant from America's Best Comic Weekly. And uh, I think these would have probably been the Sunday page put in. You'd have to check the date on that. But just some very nice Print Valiant from the artist on Prince Valiant. If you like Prince Valiant, I have another one of these that has a cover sheet on it that has a paper cover sheet. I love the maid, the maid Marian type character in the second panel there in the medieval type dress. The days of Prince Valiant, King Arthur, or some realistic looking trees and outside of buildings and the horses. Uh, and that was all this was done by Hal Foster, the great Hal Foster that drew Cr Prince Valiant. Of course, that's not all he's known for, but he is known for that for sure. And, uh, but I have one that has a cover sheet on it that I haven't put up because it has a kind of a rice paper cover sheet over the top of it to protect it from getting scuffed and scratched. This is another DC, uh, book, uh, Secrets of Haunted House, which came out and it was a 40 center came out. They dated 1979 up here in the notations. This would have been issue 15. Uh, this is a. Uh, Luis Dominguez cover. He has this little LD down here. Um, and I'm familiar through this production art and, and, uh, you know, uh, uh, Luis Dominguez never really came to my attention, but he did a lot of the horror stuff. We talked a little bit in one of my streams about Luis Dominguez that he was the first artist to do a cover after Bernie Wrightson on Swamp Thing. On issue 11, I believe, 11 or 12, I believe it's 11. I actually have a, a uh, approval cover piece of production artwork from that issue on Swamp Thing in color done by Alicia, uh, sorry, done by Luis Dominguez. I believe he was a Philippine artwork, but you have a zombie-like character that they can't stop here with their bullets. And uh, speaking of bullets, again, the bullet up here, the DC bullet is missing because it would have been printed in another cover color that would not register on here. And you can see in the notations there that uh, it says number 26. Uh, so sometimes change the numbering. Sometimes it, it's got a notation 1979 that it was... Uh, uh, published by then in 79, I'd have to look up and see if Secrets of Haunted House, number 15, you know, but in the reprints, it might have been a number 26, Kappa, something there written, you know, printed on there. Of course, you have the registration marks. Registration marks is a circle with a cross to, to help with alignment of the artwork. And then you also have on here the punch holes. You have just little black dots, one there and one there which would have been punch holes that would have aligned this uh, stuff. That's would have been photographed, would have been printed on this plastic. And of course it registers on there, shows up on there. Here's another secrets of haunted house. So try and keep these things together. Number 27. Now this is Don Heck. Don Heck mostly worked for Marvel, but yes, he did like Jim Starlin. And I believe we're going to see a Jim Starlin here in a minute. Um, and again, the bullet is, is blank because it would have been in another color and wouldn't register here. But this is an ISIS, uh, a chilling tale that will turn your blood as cold as ISIS. A little play on words there. Uh, all this would have been in, uh, uh, reproduced in black or, or these words here, at least outlined where we can read them, but would have had a, a, a separated color and not just like black up here. 
a lot of detail in here and of course a mummy cover with the moon in the background um what a great face and a pyramid in the background desert scene he's got it signed right there by his knee don heck uh what a great pose you're acting as if you really see a walking mummy well you're getting ready to find out buddy because he's coming up behind you but that's a great don heck he did a lot of early avengers covers a lot he did the first iron man you know cover and that's iron man for a long time on those early issues uh we defy you to unlock the shattering it's of haunted house haunted house of course ran for a little while um in dc comics but you see this is just outlined against the against the gray this would have been a different color there it's just indicated by this this gray background uh, but all this you know would have been colorized but uh, uh you at least have the outline and like the words are in bold would have been in black like this but uh you know you get the outline if they were going to be colorized in another way so that's that's pretty complete i mean at least it has all the dialogue even has the barcode there and and you can see the the round circular moon uh just in there that would have been probably lit uh yellow or orange or something like that pretty nice color cover by don heck actually i'm gonna check in and see about the chat real quick here Oh, comics, mate. Good day, good day. I hope you suck around. Give me uh, another chat or something. Or, you know, say hi again. Whatever. Let me know you're out there again. Uh, still got a few here. This is an early Thor. This is in uh, printed in Portuguese. And uh, acetate cover. Uh, this was the fifth appearance of Thor. Uh, and he's going up against those, not, those like, uh, big bad a communist at the time uh the cold war was going on with russia and china and uh it was till nixon that we even recognized uh, uh china's existence uh we kind of had them isolated and everything but uh yeah he went uh, a lot of, uh marvel's heroes went had communists they were battling communism just like in the uh 40s uh they battled nazis and of course in the 50s as well all during the cold war you got these early stories but this is the so this originally it says uh i don't know all this because it's in portuguese but you see thor there uh would have been of course this being the dicko box with other information call it a dicko box because he's the one that kind of come up with that it wasn't i mean this type of thing was featured in corner comics before then but dicko started that trend uh and i don't know if he'd ever seen anything like that or just came up with it on his own but we should have credit give credit where credit's due dicko kind of did that for marvel and it lasted for many many decades um and they still use it off and on today um of course, Thor shackled here with some great looking shackles uh, that depower him, I guess. Uh, again, speaking in Portuguese, so we can't, but I have a magnet uh, on my refrigerator of this. I try and get something of it. I don't have the original issue because the fifth appearance in Journey of Mystery of Thor uh, is beyond my financial means right now, but maybe one of these days. But uh, just a wonderful cover. I want you to see those shackles on his clothes and on his feet a little bit better. Great Jack Kirby cover. Jack Kirby, of course, did so many times. This was when he was really kicking off and starting to get popular, uh, uh, you know, with all the things that he was doing. Of course, Thor's hammer lying there on the ground in between his feet. Comics, Mike, thank you for coming in. Appreciate it. Hope you enjoy this content, if not now, later. This is uh, a, another one in Portuguese, but uh, this is a special one. It shows you uh, the cover uh, to the Battle of the Century 
Superman and Spider-Man. So an early crossover in one of those big treasury editions. Just uh, showing you, you know, how I believe Ross Andrew came up with the design. And uh, I think Neil Adams uh, came up with another version, you know, that they used from the Ross Andrew stuff. If I'm wrong about that, forgive me. But that shows you how the, the big treasure edition would be Superman versus Spider-Man. But uh, it shows you just how, you know, how they started with, okay, they're going to clash here. And and then they're going to, you know, they changed the the poses and got more dramatic with it until they got to the finished thing here. So this is, this would have been printed on the, I believe the inside back cover of, um, of the treasury edition. And these treasure editions were kind of like an extra, you know, if you bought, you, you couldn't miss them. Of course, Superman went up against Muhammad Ali in one. Uh, they had sort of a bicentennial one with Superman and, uh, and uh, Wonder Woman. And they went up against some Nazis. I believe the Nazis in that, at least in the Wonder Woman part of the story, was trying to kidnap uh, the then President uh, uh, Franklin Delano Roosevelt, FDR. Uh, this is another uh, uh, Firestorm, the Nuclear Man, number two. And this, uh, of course, sorry, kid, you're on your own. Okay. Uh, early cover of Firestorm that he, with Superman there. So we've got a giving an endorsement. Of course, we don't know what was in this arrow here because it would have been printed in another color i'll try and uh, gather up some of these that i've had acetates to and you can kind of see and compare but uh yeah i had a short little run firestorm when he came out and did introduce uh some some characters in there first appearances so and here's another one that introduced for the very first time number three killer frost of course, probably his number one villain, popular villain, and I do believe that this is underrated. And you see here the the little dots that would have been for kind of placement uh, and uh, great. It not only froze the people, but it looks like on the cover that a bunch of skeletons in uh, kissing, uh, kind of unusual, kissing. Firestorm on the cover. So is there some heat there? You tell me. Uh, kissing Firestorm and f starting to freeze him. Of course, how do you free totally freeze a nuclear man? But she's the number one villainess. This is her first cover appearance. Her first appearance in comics. Number three, underrated issue in my opinion. Go out and grab you a copy of it. I think it's fairly affordable. Grab it before it goes up in price. It probably is a little bit uh, higher price than some of the other issues. The other issues are, you know, first appearance of Hyena that we already looked at. And issue four, the issue after that, um, doesn't really go for a lot. But that that one with, uh, with uh, that we just looked at. Now, this is a really cool one. Again, the printing in, is done. But you can see Bob Kane giving Bob Kane credit for creating Batman. But this is early Batman, and this is done for their holiday special that came out in 1980. Uh, if you don't have that, uh, the story was then go out and grab it. I've got a copy of it. I'm trying to get a hair off here. I think it's actually a printed line. It's probably a, a, a probably a hair on the. See that little mark? That's probably a little hair. That was on when it was photographed and printed and uh, reproduced on here in the border. But uh, Frank Miller and Steve Mitchell, and uh, we can see Lynn Wynn was editor, supervisor on that. But this is tight, 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 tight pencils in the background with the, the manger scene because it was a Christmas special and you have Mary and, and you can't see Jesus because the there, but you see the wise men back there see the angels up here 
it's like uh, perhaps raining. I don't know if those are just like action lines. Get a drink here. A little dry. But look at the tight, tight pencils. You can see maybe a little future scratchiness back there. Just indicated, of course, that would have all been underlit, I think, on the original. You can see where the shadows fall on Mary's face and the wise men and everything. It was like maybe Christ was illuminated. I think it was probably raining or snowing because it was wintertime. You see the buildings in the background there uh, off to one side and a billboard. Of course, that's in Portuguese, too. And, of course, in American, it would be, in America, it would be um, in English. But uh, just a special piece because it's Frank Miller artwork, early Frank Miller artwork for DC Comics. Would have been in, uh, around the time he's doing Daredevil, I guess, for Marvel, too. I'm not sure. 1980, you tell me. He hadn't went to Marvel yet, but uh, here's a Batman, and I believe this is probably from one of the uh, Bat titles, like Detective Comics or something. I, I don't know if I've got this identified online or not, but a, a great dinosaur-like. Look how big that is, you know, and Robin speeding on a motorcycle to save and there's been some kind of heat in between these two, right? Batgirl and Robin during the years, a little bit. Um, I believe, yeah, this is Ernie Chan. Black letter there, EC. But just a wonderful, you know, how this takes up the whole thing. Um, very retro. But Ernie Chan cover. He wasn't just an inker. I know he inked uh, uh, John Basima on uh, several of the uh, Savage Short of Conans. This is another Detective Comics in the early 80s. I think this is a issue, uh, just going by memory. But it's a Jim Aparo cover. It is uh, notable because it's the first um, Red Tornado. You have the human target, I believe, down there. And you have Batman and Robin and, and, and I'm sorry, uh, Batgirl and Robin and Batman there. They generally gave you, in these boxes indicated, although a lot of it's blanked out here, they generally gave you five stories in these dollar issues. But this is notable because this is the first solo story. The first story that Red Tornado was solo, went solo, and it was just a Red Tornado story. He didn't have any any other characters from the Justice League or anything. Uh, but this this is his first solo story was in this. A great Jim Aparo cover in Detective Comics. And this would have been said Dollar Comics here and had your DC bullet, had your all your information there of what issue it was, the dollar price and i believe they put the month and the year there on those great dollar comics that came out in the early 80s late late 70s early 80s this is a swamp thing and this is notable because i think this is the next to last issue and they only used this is 76 here you can tell because the dc bullet is right in the middle and um they did this curvature. They changed the logo only for the last two issues of the original run that Bernie Wrightson first started off with, which was thing number one. And so that is next to last issue, I believe, in that run. Maybe a little Bernie Wrightson swamp thing up there in the corner. But they changed the logo to that sort of circular curvature didn't much care for that logo but uh it's only found on those two issues uh this is probably yates uh artwork if i'm wrong about that i'm i'm sorry but uh saber there he's wanting to to kill swamp thing reverting back to human 
I always liked that they did his maul in black, you know, just an indication, made him look more skull-like. Of course, Wrightson liked those black shaded areas. Thought that was very unique about him. I like it a lot better than the than the Man Thing character that came out a month before Swamp Thing came out. Of course, there's a whole story behind that. This is a Bernie Wrightson page. All the dialogue, sadly, or whatever. And in fact, I can see some shadow where they put the copy in. On my book, we, we've went in and these boxes or the shadow caused by the paste-on lettering I've had digitally removed. And she's finished that on that. This is from issue eight. They're walking in the snow. It, actually, I, I've read this story. I know that they're setting Swamp Thing up to battle this character. They're kind of like sacrificing him to this, this uh, glob of a character in a cave. And they're sort of indicating go to a cave and... They're setting him up to be destroyed. So they're kind of leading him to a trap. But you can see just the blacks there. The wonderful Bernie Wrightson interior page. You can see the the uh, where the person went into the cave. They're trying to lead him. You can see the, the uh, footprints in the snow. And they're pointing in there. Setting him up. And I think that eye in, in that panel is from the creature. That's in the right here. It's a creature that he's going to go up against. Of course, it didn't. He defeats him. Swamp Thing's not going to die. It takes more than that for Swamp Thing to die. He is one of my favorite characters, especially the burning rights and stuff. Just like everybody else, this is from. Um, this is when he finds his his wife dead. You see the under of the vehicle that's there as he's rushing towards, as this vehicle is rushing away, but he finds his wife dead. This is after he, Alex Holland uh, became the Swamp Thing. This is from Swamp Thing number one, but the Portuguese version of it. I have sold some pages from that. But scans of these, and perhaps we'll publish them in a book someday. But just great white and black areas. And look at the undercarriage there in that middle panel of the just great storytelling. You know, different va different camera angles, different vantage points of view to tell a story. That's great storytelling there. Ernie Wright's in one of the all time greats of comics. Sadly, he's passed away now. I do have some Bernie Wright's and uh, stuff from the Adler collection. So when I get around to, you know, getting that pile of Adler production artwork, which is mostly approval covers, but I do have some acetates like this, color guides, and they all come on paper. I have some paper color guides from the Adler collection. And all this stuff is rare because it's it, one of a kind. Uh, in most cases, on some of the test covers, you may get some more. Uh, you know, you might get two of kind if they're adjusting things. They did pull these for inspection uh, purposes. But this is another page from Swamp Thing number one. And this is kind of showing the, I believe, the FBI gentleman and then his wife alive here. And that's Alex Holland who would come Swamp Thing. So this is kind of a flashback, gives you a great exterior of his uh, place that he was kind of secluded under government protection to discover the things about bio life, but you see Swamp Thing there in the first panel. So a little flashback in the original from Swamp Thing number one. Again, all the dialogue done in Portuguese. And I believe this were early 80s instead of like 19, early 70s, you know, uh, when this was reproduced. So that would have been when these uh, came out, was made to reprint that down in brazil all right here we have another one and it also has swamp thing but is it a swamp thing piece no it's not it's a challenge of their own. uh they after a hiatus they picked up the numbering again i like that if you want to stop a title you know i just did one on the last adventure comics the little digest that they came out with and after 503 issues they stopped it well, why not just stop the numbering and pick it up 
instead of going back with a number one or something. They did kind of do that with Adventure Comics, but it was such a hiatus with it, and it probably didn't last but a few years. Um, you know, why not continue the numbering? But uh, they often don't. Uh, this is um, an Alex Savick and uh, Dick Garagiano did the inks cover. To me, especially this guy here, looked a lot grimacing. It looked a lot like um, uh, drawing a blank Dave Cochran artwork. Uh, and this not only has Swamp Thing, but has uh, Dead Man. And this would have been Challenge of the Unknown, 87. Uh, a Neil Adams type. Got a little fuzz there. Get that off of there so it doesn't show up. Because these are transparent. That's the cool thing. These things are transparent. Um, great action cover, but... Uh, a Neil Adams sort of uh, inspired artist. Uh, Mike Nasser did some covers around this time. I really like Mike Nasser. I have an original Mike Nasser convention drawing, I believe, or did have it. It sadly burned up my fire of the classic straight visor uh, Cyclops. And he was beaming a beam out of the done by Mike Nasser. But, uh, Really like Mike Nasser's stuff because it's really reminiscent of. But if you see that guy's grimace there on this character here, one of the challengers, can I get my finger up there? Yeah, this guy right there. Uh, it really reminds me of uh, Cockrum, of Dave Cockrum, the face. But that's Alex's work with Dick Garagiano. Uh, Inks, a 35 center, so this is Bronze Age from the 70s. And again, the bullet is because it would have been printing in another, another color. Challenge Unknown being early title that Jack and Roz. Roz did a lot of inking over Jack's early stuff on Challenge of the Unknown. And she's actually credited and should be credited as an inker on that stuff. Roz was a wonderful lady in her own right. And Jack Kirby wouldn't have been the success at home or ab abroad with the greater comic community without her support. Now, this is an unusual one. It, they had a checker top cover. Uh, this is Batman 93 by Ebal's um, numbering. Of course, mentions Brazil there. But it's a photo cover, a cosplay cover of Batman and Robin with a bunch of kids here in that panel. But you can see has the classic Batman uh, logo there, kind of from the 60s. You know, just a wonderful retro look to it. But he's got hanging off what looks like a motel balcony. He's got Robin. And Batman's holding on to him. you got to wonder what safety measures to take that picture that they, that they took. And then just kind of waving with a bunch of kids from down there in Brazil. So just a wonderful piece photo cover but checker top in their own right and i think this probably predated the the checker top covers of the 60s i'm not sure i'd have to go and look at my listing see what i know about it i see a good piece there i'm gonna have a feature from alex toth that i haven't featured yet fantastic four I believe that's Alex Toth work. If you like Alex Toth, he's, he's a pioneer in his own right. He did Johnny Thunder in, in the early, like round 73, which was a Western. But the layout of the covers are great. Check that out. Here's another one. That's Portuguese up here and the pricing and stuff. This would have been Batman number 12 by their reckoning. But it also has... A counterpart in America, of course, as most of these do. This is an Ernie Chan color cover. And he's being sliced by this female, femme fatale there. All black cover. So that's kind of going to be uh, sensitive, condition sensitive. See if I can get down there and show you the top of it a little bit more in front of the camera. But just a great piece of Batman done by Ernie Chan. 
He did a lot of in the Bronze Age, early Batman, uh, you know, early uh, Batman covers in the, in the Bronze Age in the in the seventies. He was a Batman artist. Did did interior pages as well. The whole, whole thing. We have some people from the chat that just pop in and pop out. But I'm glad you popped in and said hi. And we'll watch this on replay. This is the House of Mystery, number 281. And we think of Jim Starlet mostly as an artist for Marvel. But he did do some Weird War tales and House of Mystery covers and stuff. And this almost looks like uh, we mentioned Muhammad Ali in the Treasury Edition going up against Superman earlier in this stream. And it's cool. It's got Everlast uh, on his boxing glove and the creature that he's fighting. Looks like he's getting the best of him in this boxing. But this is a boxing round. And it is signed Starlin there on the line, on the line that's in the boxing ring. Uh, that frames in the boxing ring. And you have Kane from House of Mystery there as the referee watching this in the background. Yeah, that's often overlooked. But this is a Jim Starlin cover, boxing cover. But it's uh, one of bizarre, weird, and you can see on the boxing line there, man, it says Starlin right there above the uh, uh, barcode box. And you can see Kane as the referee back there, too, in the background if you look in the ring with them, but uh, and the creature has fangs and stuff, pointed ears. But uh, unusual thing for Jim Starlin, we don't think of him as DC Comics, but he did do some DC work, you know, some covers and stuff. Kind of like Don Heck, that early mummy, that mummy cover. So sometimes they crossed over. Oh, beautiful piece here now. Classic classic Captain America cover. And what's interesting is, this is they slanted the dialogue. The dialogue on the original Jack Kirby classic was sort of up and down straight, not as dramatic. But uh, yeah, this would have been from Tales of Suspense, which also featured Iron Man pictured there. And you have uh, done by Kirby with his mouth open, Captain America. But just a wonderful classic. Uh, I believe it's uh, Captain America 109. Of course, they picked up the title from Tales of Suspense that had this box and a similar logo that would have been talking about Iron Man as well as Captain America. And here, I, I call these burst through covers. They're, he's bursting through the news page. And that has kind of been redone and in Portuguese. Well, no, actually, it, it's still in English, but they did slant it, you know, more dramatic, really, on this example than the original. But they, they picked up Captain America's numbering at number 100. His title starts under the banner Captain America at 100, which is kind of unusual, but it was a carryover of the number. Uh, tells a suspense uh, where they two appeared in Iron Man and shared. At first, it's Iron Man, and then even before then, it was monsters and stuff like that. But just a wonderful Jack Kirby example. And I know that's been used at shows and stuff on banners uh, and been reproduced, uh, you know. And I, I have also, I have this issue with the uh, 12 cent on the cover. Uh, that's a facsimile issue. So they have used this more than once. That there a little bit different because they did a little de design choice. I think a better design choice with the with the uh, with it going backwards. Now this is an interior page from Marvel Team Up number eight, I believe, and this is a little bit more messy. And actually, uh, a corner there has been ripped. Uh, it it I always like this. This is page twenty, page twenty five, at least by the numbering on the bottom of the page there. And uh, so to all the others, uh, Hellcat makes her, or the cat makes her appearance in this. And then Man Killer, I believe, is the woman that he's being socked by, Spidey's being socked by. But continued after, uh, continued after, and then you'd have an ad. They would indicate, you know, this is chemical color, uh, chemical color plate group. 
or corporation, I'm sorry, chemical color plate corporation. So, but a little bit more messy on the, on the borders and stuff, but you have the, the uh, registration marks there. It is missing a corner there has been ripped sort of diagonal. You can kind of didn't quite get into the, the panel or the border. So that's good. All complete page. This is up for sale on, on my eBay um, under Fasas. So you can look it up if you want to buy it. It's pretty reasonable. It's one of a kind. This featured the cat or Hellcat. I guess it would have been the cat. Uh, but uh, man killer there. That was a little bit, you know, she was for a feminist. Uh, you know, they did stories like that, sort of woke stories, in my view, or just to show the absurd, absurdity of uh, sort of the ERA. Hey, Greg, great to see you again. Got another Russian bot. Darn it. Have a collection that never ends. Yeah, I mean, you know, that's that's my thing, man. In collecting, I want to share some of these goodies with you. Uh, you know, write something else in there. I'd like to see some more comments from you. Just know that you're out there. Maybe you can't hear me. I don't know. Uh, the you demanded him. Now you got him. And it's uh, Superman, Dan, Ma uh, a dead man on uh, DC Comics presents a great run that had different people at different things. This is uh, this is um, low. Um, Number 24, 40 center, another Bronze Age goodness. And this is um, Garcia, Garcia Lopez. He's actually got it embossed here. I'm glad because I was blanking on his name. But he, it looks like he might have did a little wide out here on the phasing. He's fa Dead man is phased. And he says, I thought becoming Superman would be fun. But instead of saving people, these people, I've doomed them all. <laughs> Great. Uh, this is one that I think is a very iconic cover. Iconic covers by Louise Dominguez. Yeah. If you would like me to be a wrench, I'll boot the Russian bots when I'm here. Hey, thanks, Greg. When I, uh, I will learn to do that. I will give you a wrench for sure. I'm sorry. Uh, and I think about in uh, near in the stream. Not quite. I've got a few more. But yeah, I will wrench you for sure, Greg, in the future. And uh, we'll take care of those nasty bots. I have been getting a few. And I just started. That's amazing, isn't it? But I've seen them in other streams. I would definitely wrench you, though. This is a romance comic. And this is, uh, I know I've done inked by, and I might have it flopped. No, I don't have it flopped over, but some of the writing is printed on the back. I see a black indicator. Let's see. Young Love, January number 102. And yes, I knew that, so no, no need to really flop that over. But this is Young Love. This would have been um, this would have been done by uh, Gene Colan, the inker. Not many people are interested in that. Of course, these blank areas would have been getting a call in there. And I've got to give a person a call back. Let's see what you say, Greg. The tank handles are brain cage channels, so I'm not sure exactly how to rinse someone. Yeah. Yeah, I will. I will definitely rinse you, though. Thank you for tuning in. Um, Batman number two, I'll call that, call him back. This is a retro cover. This one is done by uh, a, a artist, probably from Brazil. But I don't know that for sure because uh, AL, and he's got it stylized here. You can see it on Robin's shoulder. But he also did some of those um, featured before you came in, Greg. Uh, uh, he did some of those uh, artwork on uh, Peter Fox, the Phantom, and I've had some Phantom pages, but just a wonderful short-eared Batman, uh, Batman uh, number 22, Decem Decembro, uh, it is in Portuguese, December 1954, so there you go, some of these acetates can be quite early, and, I, and I've, got, I've got to find one, 
It's a smaller one. Get them different sizes. These are just happen to be larger, but they great retro. Uh, used to have a T-shirt that had that logo on there, retro cover. Like the fingerprints, you can see the name there on Robin's shoulder of the artist. Not sure what that says, but I do know that he did some uh, phantom stuff. I love the Batman, the early Batman 51s I have. And then, of course, he didn't have the round circle. That didn't come around to the circle, the yellow circle around the bat. It's just the bat on him. That didn't come around till the 60s. Till they kind of redid him. Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. CG rules, doesn't it? CG community's the best. I did lose a subscriber today. I don't know why. Maybe it wasn't their fair. But uh, here's another one. And what makes this is unusual, you have artwork behind a, another checker top. It is a, by Ebal. And this would have been Batman 83. Uh, I'm looking for the information on it. But it has artwork within the logo. Uh, this one I have up for sale on eBay. Of course, I don't want to get rid of these things too cheaply because they are one-of-a-kind items. Most of this stuff was scrapped. This character almost looks like Vigilante on his motorcycle back there. But another burst-through cover where they're bursting through the page. I love those probably most. You'll lose some subs sometimes, but you'll find uh, your crowd in the process. Yeah, yeah. That, that's true but just wonderful retro artwork probably these covers were never featured in america these particular ones they were done for south america audience so you're getting to see some nice batman stuff that you probably never have seen anywhere before and then of course up there in that logo all this going on where they're fighting aliens and and uh, alien-looking characters and stuff, you know, in different panels, Batman and Robin. All right. Let's see what else we got here. Treasure, 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 right? Oh, ho, ho. do you like Joker? And uh, the classic, uh, he's saying, oh, ah, oh, ah, like he's having sex. Uh but the classic Joker that would have been in limited collector's edition of Batman number C25. And of course, in, you know, him laughing, ha, 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 or whatever he's doing on the original in English is, ah, oh, ah, oh, uh, like he's got that, that uh, cane there stuck up something. I don't know, but Carmen Infantino uh, did it, it with uh, Murphy Anderson inks. And that's a nice Joker, if you like the old classic Joker. Sort of a bullet target for the background. These are large. I've got this canvas here to back them so that you can't see right through them. So kind of hard to display, but you can imagine that just matted and framed how nice that would look. Just a wonderful pinup they did for the oversized treasury editions that DC and Marvel did. Probably page 39 has the number 39 there within the treasury. I don't know the numbering can change on these ones from Brazil. Here's an action comic. Superman starring in action comics. Paul Kent alive? Superman beaten, his identity revealed, the most unforgettable story of the year. It's a 40 center, number 508. So they, Action Comics had just, uh, and I did buy that issue, number 500. It's a Ross Andrew and Dick Garagiano cover where Batman's coming in with Lois Lane and Paul Kent there all beaten up, flown in the window. Of course, these little boxes indicated here, little check. Oh, uh, has like inventory number, code number, month, you know, and up here, you know, of course, cover title, action comics, month, and their printing of this would have been, uh, uh, and I, it was probably the same as America. That sounds about right. 680. Oh, this is 508. Tarnation. Who could have done that to you? 
and I believe he says son. Of course, these blank spots would have been in the dialogue were printed in another color, so they don't, and she's spilling her coffee there, Lois is. And then you have uh, the blue TC on the side, the black, the yellow TC, the red, that indicates, and uh, you have a little numbering that they used to do on that. It says addition, and it's kind of scratched out there, but even in the notations here, even though it's signed on that, it says Andrew and Garagiano. All that for 40 cents after passing, surpassing 500 issues. Okay, okay, gonna have to get through this. Don't mean for these things to go so long, but I just have so much of this stuff, huh? Here's a Superman in Action Comics 502. And uh, with Supergirl, another Ross Andrew and Dick Garagiano cover. I want to give you a good look without glare. And you've probably seen some of these. You might even have. I mean, you know, they're only about 35. So, you know, I don't know, 40 years. Maybe you read some of this stuff as a kid. More of a battling a galactic. Says the uh, great moons of Krypton, the galactic golem is killing Superman. Now I see why he left me here in the fortress to save my life. Left her in the uh, Supergirl in the fortress of solitude, just so he can go sacrifice himself. Oh, here's a tank cover. Oh, tank ferret. Yeah, you should change your title channel to the comic historian. I think you have to have a hundred subscribers to change your title or something like that. The, the, uh, these glimpses of comic history are priceless. Yeah. You may never see it on another stream again. I mean, they're one of a kind of items, right? Um, yeah, but tank will love this. Of course, they're fighting the Nazis. You've got a swastika on the Nazi helmet and you're within the, the Nazi tank and they're firing on the haunted tank. He wanted some haunted tank goodness. Here's some haunted tank goodness. Of course, this was Joe Kubert cover and you have all the heads. Uh, this was a kind of a special issue. This was one of the dollar uh, comics, the big war book, 80 pages, all new for a dollar GI combat, seven fury field combat tales, the barbarian bomb sink that tank battle by the book. Everyone's a Loser, guest starring The Losers, which had uh, Johnny Thundercloud there, I think. If you know uh, the uh, the characters, this would have been June, July, as it indicates up there, uh, issue. I've went back. I actually have these comics, and I'll feature them. But now this is production art that helped produce that stuff. She's firing a machine gun there. You got a nice black biplane sometimes they would tell world war one stories as well but uh yeah you get uh, joe kubert's signature right there iconic signature that reduced there but you get to see the inside of the nazi uh, tank looking and firing upon and hitting the haunted tank who's also firing back but this also had the losers in there yeah tell tank ferret at least to skip to this part and see that Maybe I'll have some more tank stuff here. I do have some some more GI yeah, combat and stuff. Here's another war one. Uh, Unknown Soldier. Adolf Hitler cover. Um, number 228. And it's another Joe Kubert cover. Behind enemy lines can the immortal warrior save secret crown. Plus a battle bonus in that issue. And uh, the other captions there or not you know this would have been done you know color swastika on his band adolf hitler cover don't know if you've seen any of those greg but uh that's joe kubert goodness with the un with the horse here and unknown soldier on that running towards to save him from being killed by adolf hitler i guess Again, the bullet, the banner there, the DC, and it would have said like maybe all new or something had a little diagonal line on this one. Maybe 40 center, I think. 
Oh, this is a special one. This is the last showcase cover. Showcase, and I've talked about this. Showcase number 104, 50 cents, 44 pages. Showcase introduced to this league, Cave Carson, Adam Strange, Green Lantern, The Adam. Just so many. Dolphin. Uh, even had uh, one on G.I. Jo uh, Joe. Even had one on James Bond, Dr. No. Uh, you know, just introduced certain books. But this is the last cover, and it's done by Joe Kubert. A lot of swastikas on this one. Uh, the OSS Spy War, you know. And there were several famous people that we know in the OSS spying uh, during World War II. Um, Christopher Lee, who played Dracula and other the Mummy and other greats in the horror, he was in the OSS. Julia Childs, and we're cooking today uh, in the kitchen, uh, full turkey, and I will show you the spices. And the she was in the OSS. She was a spy, a big spy in World War II, and of course, Iron Fleming was a spy uh, that wrote all the uh, James Bond novels. So. 104, the last sort of a, a, you know, have acrobats there with the Nazis down there, Nazi soldiers with their raised uh, machine guns and pistols. It says, unless the identity of the spy known as uh, Arthur, Arthur is revealed, we will execute these two. So they're trying to get the crowd to talk. You see the ringmaster in the background there, and uh, they're, Swinging by the ankles, they're going to kill that beautiful woman. And who? Maybe, maybe that's Dick Grayson, uh, a Robin swinging back. I doubt that in the forties. But you see Joe Kubert's uh, signature there to the bottom, over the Nazi helmet, and lots of swastika in that one. But this is the key one. This was the last issue. This is the last issue. Christopher Lee was every bit as bad as the monsters. Yeah. As the, uh, in the SS. Yeah. Uh, you know, he actually got in hard rock and made some hard rock, uh, um, uh, albums, you know, some music before he, he passed away. He, even as early as the 1970s, he was in a hard rock. So check out some of his music. You wouldn't think of him as a, from his generation being a hard rock, uh, enthusiast. Uh, I want to say metal, you know, not just hard rock, but metal music. All the World War II propaganda comics, uh, blend in together in my memory. Yeah. Don't think you've ever seen that book. No. Yeah. The last one showcase. Hey, we would like to show you things that you haven't seen before. This was a wraparound cover done by Joe Kubert. Robot cover you see on the back there, planes. Uh, another tank there in that one. Uh, tank for the main one. That's horizontal, GI Combat. This would have been one of the big dollar comics. Sorry for the little bleed through of the red there. I do have my company logo that years and years ago I did. I'll show it to you. You probably wanted to see these, but... Uh, yeah, some of these GI combats that were wrapped around were done instead of this way. They were done horizontally. That's kind of different. Big issue for your money. But yeah, that's what we're... Momentum for momentum concepts or back then momentum comics. I may use... I, I was going for quick splash, quick brush work, seeing if I could do that and right over the logo whoop gotta flip this around another gi combat tank cover so yeah share this with tank ferret uh he can go to the end of it and skip ahead if he doesn't want to see all those other one of a kind treasures but this would have been a dollar comic with different features this one didn't have a wraparound cover uh and nice tanks nice other things that's joe kubert as well of course that's a haunted tank there he wanted some haunted tank. Here's some haunted tank. You got the uh, rebel flag flying there. It's coming off the back of the tank, as always. And in some, you see the, uh, the the general. Yeah, tank will love these for sure. <laughs> well, good. I'm glad to service him. I just saw this pile there sitting and uh, didn't even think about the tanks, but 
Yeah, I'm looking for the tank stuff. I've got a lot of a lot of these in color, you know, a lot of the books. Here's a wraparound, GI Combat. And this has a Sphinx in the background and several tanks, uh, you know, in different panels and stuff. But this was wraparound, show you the front and the back and the Rebel flag. Again, the haunted tank. Sorry for the bleed through there. Should have just got a blank canvas. Little skull watch there. These are big, so it's kind of hard to, and I know it's, and they're rushing forward. The, I think that's like a ancient, uh, Egyptians rushing forward at the tank with their swords. I don't think they're going to do so well. Even have a frog man in there. And I like how he made these separated this out and like a star design, the different panels on the back. Let's see. I haven't heard of uh, from Tank yet to know if you're we're streaming tonight or not. But if we're going to, on and welcome to join in. Okay. Yeah. 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 These are painting history. Yeah. Look at the star design that he did on the back there. Frogman in the middle. Beautiful Sphinx. Joe Kubert. Of course, he was a great dinosaur guy. He loved to draw dinosaurs and other stuff. Did, I think that's why he did tour back in the early 50s and subsequent years, you know, when he could. Uh, caveman times. Here's another GI combat. Glad I left these to last so that you could see them. Uh, yeah, there's a tank on there and it's haunted tank. And I also has the general charging ahead here. What was his name? Do you know? I can't remember. It's interesting what they did with the barcode there and kind of blocked it there. Blocked it out. This would show you what you get for a dollar. When you buy one of these for a dollar, come on, man. These are big, 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 big comics. And they're still fairly affordable. Uh, and I'm glad to see in the last five, six years or so uh, that... Uh, some of is that the in the Overstreet update they actually are featuring uh, war comics. Uh, I've heard that war comics are generally, you know, from like sixty five backwards. You're probably uh, more likely to get a um, very good, to very good plus, and that's about it in condition because people read these. This is un unusual. I don't know why they did this. Don't know everything about the printing process, but they have black, uh, blacked out, you know, here in the artwork and on the type and around and blank spaces and even in the borders. I don't know why they did that, but this is issue 199 haunted tank got of, uh, featuring the haunted tank. And, uh, you have the swastika flag there. It says haunted tank, easy to identify. I've got some. I've got some of war stuff in the Jack Adler collection. That one you will not want to miss. When I, I show my Jack Adler collection, I probably have the best Jack Adler collection in the world, along with my friend, if I combine those two. And great tank cover being uh, the haunted tank wanting to go off the edge there. Another Joe Kubert great. And look how he bowed the flag there. Just wonderful, and you see the Nazi flag above it, a triumphant big explosion knocking over the side. But I don't know why they put these block uh, black in. I really don't know. I've got a swamp thing, or did have uh, uh, like that as well. One of the first swamp thing covers I ever swamp thing versus swamp thing, and it may be in here, it may be coming up. I've, I've just got a few left. Yeah, awesome. Glad you're liking these. You won't see them anywhere else. I might as well show them. Oh, this is great. Oh, yeah. Weird War Tales, number 89. And this is a hard one to get sometimes. Uh, just the book, you know. Uh, Jim Starlin cover, and I like that he wrote Starlin. You might not be able to see it because it's uh, sort of black against gray there on the Nazi helmet. But it's the primate platoon. It's gorillas. <laughs> Uh, uh, Jim Starlin, we think of him again as working for Marvel. Here's a big swastika in the back, but weird war tales. 
and they did, of course, gorilla covers were very popular with the kids. And there in the sixties, especially they did a lot of gorilla covers because they knew they sold better, but that's Jim Starlin. You can maybe see him on that helmet there, just on the brim, right under the swastika. It says Starlin, Jim Starlin cover. So you got some ape goodness from Jim Starlin. If you like Jim Starlin artwork, sadly, I had an original Jim Starlin page from DC comics presents burn up in my first fire. So no more Jim Starlin artwork, but some John Byrne and some uh, uh, Aztec Ace, World Aztec Ace page. This is another Joe Kubert, another Weird War Tales. This is number 90. And this is, a, a, I guess, a Nazi vampire because he's got a swastika not only prominently on the coffin, and I've actually talked to a guy, you know, uh, uh, a casket is what we use here. And this shape here is a coffin, the one they use in the movies, like Christopher Lee movies, Hammer movies with Joe Kubert's signature there with all the all the things on there. But you see the hand coming out of the coffin. And this is this is this particular one. They're in the side inside a submarine. Inside a submarine. So some good uh, copper age or bronze, I, I guess this here 40 cents would be sort of transitioning from uh, the bronze age to the copper age, which I call the 80s or some say modern age. So if you like Joe Kubert, Joe Kubert just really didn't do it, but he's one of those artists that I've come back and yeah, yeah, Infinity Gauntlet series, yeah. How many gorilla characters have been in comics over the decades? Yeah. It's it's set in World War Hell. Yeah. Yeah. All right. I believe this is the last one in the stack. It's GI Combat, another Joe Kubert, dated 1979. And this is a execution cover where the Nazis are there in the foreground and they're hanging three individuals, which really happened. Of course, some of those uh, stinking Nazis got their got their comments come up it's after the after the trials of nuremberg huh they got hung as well but there's another joe kubert and he's been fired upon there in the haunted tank uh and he's got a lovely lady in his arms and he's defending her with his i uh, don't think that's a luger but uh his pistol but just beautiful artwork and again these blank bullets here and you see there it says big that that was at least indicated but yeah, three battle books in one, you know, have all these stories, give you a lot for your dollar. But you see this double thing that indicates that you would have the DC bullet. And what I loved about the dollar ones, again, is that it pictured, uh, pictured the month and the year and the price, you know, gave you a lot. I, I like to have that on the cover where I can just glance and say, yeah, that's a 1983 cover. Or that's And these always did around in the circular motion. And, and you know, them being dollars, they were either late seventies or early eighties. Well, I appreciate you dropping in again, Greg, and uh, glad you got to catch and actually interact a little bit. And, uh, yeah, if you'd done that on my millennial stream on new year's, you would have won a free comic. Why well, I might send you one, anyone D DM me and I might send you one anyway for your great interaction. I'll just send it to you. You give me your address. You probably follow me on Twitter, I hope. Yeah, that's the end of that box. I've got to put these back in there and find some more treasures. So till next time, peace, and we'll see you maybe tonight on the stream. So bye for now.